Um, all right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Avoid Common Mistakes When Benchmarking Officers. It's so great to see you all on the line. Many of these topics may be new for some, while being a reminder for others, but no matter where you are um, in the benchmarking process, hopefully you can find some of these tips useful. All right, so the agenda for today's session is meant to be an overview of the office property type uh, for those who are new to benchmarking or those looking for a refresher. Um, so we'll first just overview the office property definition, and then we'll also be diving into some common mistakes that arise when benchmarking use details, um, the data center issues that might commonly pop up, and uh, benchmarking vacant space. Uh, we'll also be touching on how to determine whether the office is a standalone structure, um, how to access whole building data, um, and capturing changes from COVID-19. And then we'll finally be wrapping up with a Q&A session at the end of this presentation, as Alice mentioned, where I'll be joined by my colleague, John Jamison, to answer any of your questions on today's presentation content. So before we get too far, I want to take some time now to go over the basics on office property types to set the stage for our subsequent topics. So what is an office? You may be familiar with how a portfolio manager defines an office, but it's important to know what kinds of spaces can be included in the growth floor area of the office property type. So many times we'll see applicants break out separate property uses for the conference rooms, lobbies, um, or ground floor retail spaces and restaurants that might exist in their property. But all of these spaces actually can be included in your main office growth floor area. So we do understand that breaking out individual spaces might be helpful for internal tracking efforts. So if that is the case where you want to track um, the specific property types that exist in your office building, you can still definitely break these spaces out. But just note that it won't necessarily increase the accuracy of your ENERGY STAR score. That is, unless the property use type that you're breaking out can actually get a score of its own. So um, this is to say the ENERGY STAR office scoring model is um, ultimately based off of a robust set of CBEX data, um, which will designate a single property type based on the type that accounts for 75% or, or more of the building. So. Um, even if you do have a restaurant or a retail space um, on the ground floor of your office building, um, if it is not eligible to get a score, which a restaurant, for instance, um, is a property type that is not eligible, or the retail space, if it's less than 5,000 square feet, it also can't get a score, then portfolio manager will simply designate your property as an office if the office makes up 75% uh, or more of the gross floor area. So even if you do break out separate property types, portfolio manager will just add them back into the property use, um, the office property use before calculating the ultimate metric. So um, that is one thing to note. But there are certain cases where you might want to break out um, property uses. Uh, so while EPA does recommend breaking out as few property uses as possible, um, if a property use meets any of the four criteria listed on this slide, then you should, in fact, break it out as its own separate space. So, um, for example, if you have an office with a retail store that is greater than 5,000 square feet on its um, ground floor, then you must break it out because a retail store larger than 5,000 square feet is um, a property space type that is eligible for an ENERGY STAR score of its own. Um, additionally, if more than 10% of your office growth floor area is vacant, you are required to break out that vacant space. And we'll speak more um, to the logistics of benchmarking vacant space later on in the presentation, um, but that is another one of the criteria for breaking out a separate property use. And then you should also break out um, two distinct office property users, if those two office tenants in your building have weekly operating hours that differ by 10% or more. Um, so that is just another one of the use cases where you might want to break out a separate property use, uh, even if that is also an office 
space type. Um, so some common mistakes with breaking out separate properties is for office for offices include um, breaking out scorable retail stores as um, a property type of other um, or neglecting to to break out retail at all. So um, it's important to note that retail stores have that very strict minimum gross floor area requirement of 5,000 5, square feet um, and also has to have its own exterior entrance to the public uh, in order to be benchmarked as a retail space. So some eligible retail store configurations would include um, freestanding stores, individual stores in open air or strip malls, and large department stores in enclosed malls with exterior entrances. Um, but then some ineligible configurations would include entire enclosed malls, entire strip malls and individual stores located within enclosed malls without an exterior entrance. Um, and then another mistake that some folks will make is breaking out non-retail spaces as retail. So oftentimes applicants will benchmark restaurants or service-oriented services to supermarkets as retail spaces. But the retail store definition um, strictly refers to individual stores used conduct the retail sale of non-food consumer goods. Uh, so that is a distinction to be made um, when thinking about the retail spaces that are eligible for score, for an unreduced star score, and then must be broken out as a result as a separate property use. Um, all right, so we're gonna have now our first pop quiz of this session. So just to keep everyone on their toes and make sure that we're all absorbing the content of today's um, presentation, we have a few like audience interaction questions uh, kind of interspersed throughout the presentation. So this one is definitely longer and the, the pop quizzes in this um, presentation are all a bit lengthier. So I'll give folks um, a minute to answer this and I'll go ahead and um, open the poll. So you should be able to access it on the right hand side of your screen um, under the polling panel. And there are a multiple choice question of five answers. And I'll also just go ahead and read the question itself. So a 100,000 square foot office building includes the following property uses on the ground floor. A 10,000 square foot restaurant an 8,000 square foot fitness center, a 6,000 square foot retail store, and a 2,000 square foot retail store. Both retail stores have an exterior entrance to the public. Which of the following property uses should be broken out as a separate UC typo property type in Portfolio Manager? All right, I'll give folks another 20 seconds or so to answer. It looks like most folks on the line have been able to attempt this question. So I'll go ahead, close out the poll, and share the poll results with everyone. So um, I think most of the folks who answered this question got it correct. So the correct answer is the 6,000 square foot retail store should be broken out as a separate property use type. Um, the square footage, use details, and energy consumption of the restaurant, fitness center, and the 12,000 square foot retail store should all be included in the main office property use. Um, so the restaurant and the fitness center shouldn't be broken out because either property use accounts for more than 25% of the gross floor area of the property and are also two property types that are simply uneligible, ineligible to um, earn energy star scores. Um, and then the 2,000 square foot retail store shouldn't be broken out separately because um, if you remember only retail stores over 5,000 square feet can earn the energy star score. And because this retail store is too small, it shouldn't be broken out. Um, all right, great job everybody on that. Um, and now we're going to talk through uh, the office property type specific use details. So, 
The number of workers on main shift is a pretty important use detail that's used to calculate the energy star score. So we found that um, through application reviews and audits, uh, unfortunately, many applicants are determining the workers on main shift by counting all workers present in the building in a given day or providing um, a full-time equivalent count of workers. But this is not how EPA def defines uh, this specific use detail. Um, what the number of workers on main shift is meant to reflect is the total number of workers physically present during the primary shift. So if you have multiple shifts during the day, the number of workers in the larger shift should be entered as the number of workers on main shift. So think about like if you have two eight hour shifts, um, one of the eight hour shifts has 20 workers and the other one has 100 workers, the number of workers on main shift should be reported as 100. Um, and then you can also use just the average count across the days you're open if you find that, that the worker count fluctuates um, day to day during the week. So towards the end of the presentation, um, we'll also touch on how the COVID-19 pandemic might have impacted this use detail for the office property type and EPA's guidance on how it should be adjusted. Um, but it, it should also be noted that uh, for part-time workers, they should be counted, but only to be counted um, when whenever they're present at one time. So um, if they are part of the main shift, that includes the majority of the workers, then they should be counted. And if they are not, then they also should not be counted. Um, and then moving on to the weekly operating hours use detail. Um, for buildings like offices and also uh, includes property types such as warehouses, you should reflect the hours that the majority of building occupants are in the building. So the most common mistake we see is applicants interpreting this as the HVAC startup or shutdown time, or um, interpreting it as when the building is open uh, to determine weekly operating hours, but um, that is not correct. So the weekly operating hours should not include HVAC startup or shutdown time or the time that only like maintenance and security staff are in the building. Um, but for, you know, for businesses that are open to the public, such as retail stores, it should also not represent the hours when only employees are present, um, such as overnight inventory or, or restocking. If runtime fluctuations apply, or, or if there are extended seasonal hours associated with the building, you'll also just want to take an average and be sure to document the observations. If um, you know the weekly operating hours aren't as clean cut uh, as confirmed by the building management, um, and then in some situations, buildings also have multiple tenants where there, there are widely varied hours. So you'll need to break out spaces whose operating hours deviate from each other by 10% or more, which was mentioned on that slide where um, there are four exceptions to the rule when you'd want to break out an extra property type. Um, and you'll, you'll need to verify that the um, that uh, there are an additional property is being created for longer or shorter hour tenants. Um, so that is one thing to keep in mind when breaking out a separate office property use. Um, all right, so having covered the number of workers on main shift and the weekly operating hours um, use details, we'll jump into yet another pop quiz, um, which tests your knowledge of the number of workers on main shift use details. So I'll go ahead and open yet another poll here. Um, and this question reads, an office is open five days per week. During the first shift, there are 120 workers present from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So that's 40 hours a week. Um, 100 employees on the property, uh, 100, excuse me, employees of the property, 10 subcontractors that are on site regularly, and 10 interns. Um, during the second shift, there are 80 workers present from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. The office also has 20 visitors in the building on average each day. So what is the number of workers on main shift for this property? I'll get folks about 30 seconds to go ahead and get their responses in.
and we've gotten quite a few responses. I'll go ahead and close out this question. Okay. And it looks to me like most folks also got the stretch. So um, yes, the number of workers on main shift should be 120 because the 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. shift is when a majority of new workers are present. Um, and also the 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. shift would not be included. Um, and the, the count of the, 70, the, the 88 workers who work this shift should not be counted because this doesn't represent the largest shift of the day. Um, and also the number of workers does not include visitors to the property as part of its definition. So um, those 20 visitors would also not be counted. So good work on that. Um, and then we're just going to follow this up with yet another pop quiz um, to test your understanding of the weekly operating hours use details. So I'll go ahead, open that really quickly. Um, and this question reads, an office building stores are unlocked from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, so that is 45 hours. Outside these hours, a key card is required for entry. The building houses a total of 1,000 workers during those hours. Each evening, about 250 workers remain until 8 p.m. On the weekends, there are about 120 workers present at any given time between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. HVAC runs 24-7. What is the number of weekly operating hours that should appear on this building energy star application? All right, um, we're also getting a good number of responses here. So I will say that there is a typo on this question that affects the um, correct answer or that will appear on the next slide. But we'll go ahead and close this out. Thanks all who have responded. Um, so the answer for this should be 45 hours based on how the question is worded um, in our initial and how uh, in the slide before, but as you can see in the question that was typed out on this slide, it says each evening about 750 workers remain until 6 p.m. Um, and if that were the case, that means that um, the main shift, which is a 45 hour weekly shift um, from 8 to 5 p.m., five days a week, with has 1,000 workers on the main shift. But then if 70, 750 workers were to remain until 6 p.m., um, that would mean that uh, it would still be a majority of the main shift workers that stay until 6 p.m., which means that the um, actual weekly operating hours would be the 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. shift five days a week, which would account for the 50 hours um, that you see as the correct answer here. So for anyone who responded 45 hours, that is absolutely correct. Um, but do this typo, the correct answer would be uh, C on this slide. Um, so that is uh, that is a bit of a blip here, but um, just the important thing to remember is that the weekly operating hours is defined as um, the hours during which the majority of the workers on site are present. So therefore it would be 50 hours. All right. Moving on to our next topic, which is data centers. Um, we definitely see a lot of data centers benchmarked within offices, so we want to take some time to cover this specific property type. Um, so for true data centers, we want to make sure that the space complies with the EPA definition of a data center. Um, and the LP will need to be sure that the space is broken out as a data center if uh, any of these conditions are met where the space has a constant demand load of more than 75 um, kilowatts, if there is a dedicated cooling system, um, if there is an uninterruptible power supply or UPS, 
and if there are raised floors. Um, the data center definition should not be applied to small server closet, computer training area, telecom closet, or print and copy rooms. Um, and they should, like all of these spaces, should just be included as part of the primary property type, um, typically the office property. Um, speaking of data centers, um, as far as meeting their energy and portfolio manager, um, the IT energy is meant to represent the total amount of energy required by the service rack, storage silos, and other IT equipment in the data center space. Um, and in order to use measured IT energy in your application, the energy needs to be submetered at the UPS output configuration or in some rare cases, the PDU input. Um, and the non-IT load should, if, uh, if any, um, should be less than 10% of the total energy load. Um, additionally, if your IT energy meter is not able to capture energy readings in kilowatt hours and only provides power readings, which is measured in kilowatts, it must be able to record power readings at least every 15 minutes. Um, and if your data center metering setup doesn't meet all of these requirements, then you are recommended to use data center's energy estimates, um, which is a feature available in Portfolio Manager or um, benchmark the space as a 24 seven office space, which means it should be reported with zero workers on the main shift, um, 168 weekly operating hours and um, the number of computers re reported as equal to the number of servers in the space. Um, right, so if, if the UPS in the data center provides um, more than 10% of its power to a non-IT load, which um, might include cooling equipment, lighting, HVAC, plug loads, um, and then the applicant is required to exclude the non-IT equipment. So this measurement can be done in two ways, either by submetering the non-IT equipment and subtracting that energy from the total UPS energy, or by supplying a reading from the input uh, to the PDU that supports only the IT equipment. Um, and then one important thing to note here is that uh, IT energy should be a submeter to the main energy meters. So that means that the IT energy should be included in both the main meters, which account for all energy used in the building, including IT energy, um, as well as reported out in the separate IT energy meters. Um, and then there's also a bunch of FAQ articles that exist that really delve into um, some specifics on benchmarking data centers that can be accessed on the link on the screen. Um, and for reference, the slides and the presentation recording will be sent out to all registrants um, after the session. So you'll be able to access any of the links that are embedded in the presentation um, pretty shortly after. Um, all right, so looking back to some of, the, um, some of the comments I made on data centers before related to applying data center energy estimates, um, this is an option if your data center doesn't have proper metering configuration because it's pretty tough to find um, to uh, have your submeter like meet all of these EPA requirements. So if that's the case, don't worry. Uh, you can definitely still benchmark your data center using uh, one of two options. Um, the first is to apply data center energy estimates. And um, these estimates can be applied as a space meet the EPA definition of a data center, um, as well as if the um, growth floor area is less than 25% of the property's growth floor area. So um, there is, in fact, a cap on large data centers, and the estimates are really only intended to be used on small data centers. Um, and if you do report a data center that exceeds 10% um, of the property's growth floor area, then portfolio manager will only apply estimates for that data center up to 10% of the property's GFA. Um, so that is something that's uh, important to keep in mind. And then your other option is just to, as I mentioned before, benchmark the space as a 24-7 office property type, but report the use details as 168 weekly operating hours, um, zero workers on the main shift, and uh, the non-zero count of computers, which should represent the number of servers in the space. Um, 
All right, so that essentially covers how you should be uh, mirroring or benchmarking um, data centers for your office. Um, so the next thing we'll talk about is vacant space. So in um, certain commercial properties, space is often left vacant for short periods of time as people and organizations will shift in and out of the building during the application period. So if that occupancy level fluctuates, then it should be kept up to date in the whole property's occupancy value, which can be edited on your details tab and portfolio manager. Um, and then for office buildings, you should also keep track of any substantial vacant space just using your property use details. Um, so notably, if the vacant space in an office building is greater than 10% of the whole building's gross floor area, um, then that vacant space will need to be entered as a separate office property use uh, with zero weekly operating hours, zero computers, and zero workers on the main shift. Um, one pretty frequent mistake we'll see in vacant spaces is that there's a non-zero weekly operating hour reported. So um, as a reminder, weekly operating hours and the number of workers on in shift are inherently linked because they're the, the operating hours are determined by when the majority of workers are present in the space. So if there are zero workers, then the operating hours should also be zero. Um, and if the space is vacant, then you should be benchmarking with zero workers present and also with zero weekly operating hours. Um, additionally, if you have a property that is, for example, 15% vacant from January to June, and then um, that vacancy is filled, so then it just becomes 5% vacant for the rest of the um, application period from July to December, you should break out the vacant space from January to June and then update the properties um, to show a decrease in the vacant space gross floor area uh, starting in July when it decreases to 5%. Um, so this can be done using the action drop down menu in the details tab where you can hit update with new information and then create um, kind of a time weighted average of how your gross floor area fluctuates during your application period. Um, but the LP also needs to make sure that the data and application is maintained in both the occupied and the vacant uh, spaces that have been broken out. So um, while the, the occupied space, uh, while the occupied property type might have its gross floor area increase, at the same time, the vacant space should see um, some of that gross area, gross floor area decrease if there is a decrease in the vacant space within the property. Um, so that covers vacant space and how to break it out for your office property. We'll then jump into the topic of single versus multiple structures. Um, so the office property type is one that has to be benchmarked as a single building and isn't eligible to be benchmarked at the campus, which means a collection of two or more buildings acting as a single property. Um, only property types, including multifamily, housing, um, K-12 schools, hospitals, senior living communities, um, are able to benchmark as a campus. Um, so, you know, being that offices have to benchmark as one building, we'll go through some examples of acceptable and unacceptable office configurations based on whether they can be considered as a single structure. So, the first example we have listed here is a single tower with an office on floors one through eight and a hotel on floors nine through 14. So this can be benchmarked as an office um, if, if most of this property's gross floor area consists of office space. Um, so although you may think of the office and the hotel as separate, and they might even be run by separate companies, this is technically one single tower that must receive certification at the whole building level and includes both the office and the hotel space. Um, so properties that are, you know, vertically stacked in a single tower structure are always considered a single structure because they share an indivisible actual physical connection. Um, the next example listed here is an office complex that consists of three buildings connected by underground walkways that allow workers to move between buildings without going outside. Um, this is not considered a single structure, even though there is, you know, a totally enclosed walkway that might be ventilated. Um, and each of these three buildings would need to be benchmarked 
as separate office properties. Um, the energy use from the underground walkway in this example, which might include some lighting, heating, and cooling loads, would still need to be included. But because this is very minimal, it doesn't really matter which of the buildings you decide to add it to. Um, or, you know, if the tunnel energy is, in fact, submetered, then you can just divide the energy among the three separate buildings equally. Um, and then the last example on this page is two office towers that are built on top of a street level retail store. So um, you can walk from one tower to the other through the store, I'm assuming, in this example. And if you're assuming that, you might have two options. Um, so the best practice is probably to benchmark each tower separately and divide um, the retail spaces, gross floor area, and energy consumption proportionately between the two properties. But this is also an instance where you can use your discretion and benchmark both towers as one property because the retail store technically constitutes a seamless connection um, or, you know, is can be considered a shared functional space between the two buildings. Um, so, you know, technically the property could also be considered a single structure and it, and it wouldn't be incorrect to benchmark it as um, one single office property. So there are cases where there is, um, there, there is a bit of gray area in some of these cases. All right, um, so then we'll talk about this important, um, this important topic of whole building data access. Um, for an office property to be eligible to apply for certification, it will need to have 12 months of whole building measured energy data, which includes energy used in all common spaces and individual tenant um, office spaces across all fuel types used at the property. So EPA is definitely aware that one of the major barriers to benchmarking and improving the energy efficiency of office and all of the property types um, with multiple individually metered tenants is accessing the whole building measured energy data. So while EPA cannot um, on its own directly make that data available, uh, they are participating in numerous activities and meetings aimed at engaging utilities in discussions regarding uh, solutions to this ongoing challenge. Um, and so on this slide here, there is a link to an interactive map that um, captures all of the utilities already participating in um, providing whole building aggregated data. Um, so that'll be helpful for searching up your service territory and seeing if you're able to access that data and if the infrastructure for your utility is already in place. Um, if it is a case where your utility is not one, that already provides whole building energy data, um, you can definitely take certain measures, uh, including installing a master meter on the property on your own if it's financially and technologically feasible. Um, you can also ask residents to provide the meter data upon request. Um, so this option probably works best when there aren't too many tenants. And to facilitate this, some landlords are including these requirements in leases. Um, but you can also coordinate with your utility by getting a tenant release form from all tenants that would then tell your utility that you're able to request whole building aggregated data or the individual tenant's data to aggregate into one meter. Um, and then finally, you can consider joining the groups that currently exist that call, are calling on utilities to make this data available so that utilities will work so that more utilities will work and recognize the importance of working towards data access solutions. All right. And then the last big topic we'll be covering today um, is that which involves complying with COVID-19 guidance. Um, so during the 2020 certification year, we had a pretty large mix of buildings with time periods affected by COVID while others had applications with time periods unaffected by COVID. Um, but for the 2021 certification year, since September 30th, 2020 is the earliest um, period ending date or PED available. Um, all, all submitted applications have fallen within a time frame where COVID-19 was still present or affected their use details. So for office properties in particular, you um, must update the number of workers on main shift and weekly operating hours if they were affected by COVID-19. 
Um, and it's important to keep the definitions of these use details in mind as you make these updates. Um, and one of the most common issues with complying with COVID-19 guidance has been uh, with updating weekly operating hours at use detail, because oftentimes properties will maintain that, you know, their building operations and HVAC startup and shutoff times have remained the same. But uh, it's important to remember that weekly operating hours are not determined by HVAC schedules, but they are determined by the number of workers on the main shift. So a lot of office properties might have seen a large decrease in the number of workers on main shift. And consequently, we'll have to confirm that the weekly operating hours were also not affected or were affected by this decrease. Um, so if on or both of these, sorry, if you know these these use details um, were not affected by, by COVID-19, it's important to indicate um, in your explanation for the COVID-19 alert that comes up now for every single application um, that the use details did not change. Um, and the review team has found through a lot of follow-up that the most applicants um, were not aware of how EPA defines these use details or requires them to be changed. So, you know, if your use details really were unaffected and you confirm that you understand um, how these use details were defined, please, please provide a detailed explanation for why this was the case. And um, then you can also reference the use detail definitions to ensure that they've been correctly accounted for. Um, Right. And then also, I guess one thing to add, part of this COVID-19 um, question embedded into the application also asks if there were any disruptions to the site visit, um, such as having any portion of the building off limits or restrictions on what IEQ measurements could be taken. Um, if this is the case, and even if you know there were no disruptions, it would be good to indicate in your applicant explanation for the COVID-19 alert how the site visit uh, was conducted or might have been impacted during the COVID-19 period. All right, um, so now some logistical details about the 2021 um, certification year. So we have come out with the um, formal application submission deadline for 2021, which is Friday, December 10th, 2021. Um, and then we have also decided effective January 1st, 2022, um, to suspend the, uh, or to, I guess, reenact the 120-day rule to submit applications after the period ending date. So there was a rule that required you to submit verified applications within 120 days after the period ending date um, for any application uh, with a PED of October 31st or later, October 31st, excuse me, 2020 or later. So, um, this suspension is, you know, going to be lifted as of 2022. So it's important to note um, when you are submitting your application that your PED cannot be 120 days earlier than when you are submitting it, or three months, or excuse me, four months earlier than when you are submitting the application. Um, and then this chart here also has um, helpful note on um, when you can expect your application to be processed. So as application volume increases closer to the certification application deadline, um, you can see that the turnaround um, for when your initial application review will happen uh, might extend for up to 10 business days between the fall months of September through November, um, 20 business days from November through December, um, from early November through December, and then during the peak um, period of when the applications come in, um, which is roughly like a week prior to the deadline, you can make the expected turnaround time of 25 business days. Um, all right, and then we have this list of additional resources for you. So if you'd like to test your knowledge on any of the content covered in today's webinar, the Energy Star Quiz for Licensed Professional contains some challenge questions that cover property specific use detail calculations for offices. Um, and then for any questions that aren't addressed in today's Q&A session that will happen shortly, folks are encouraged to use our existing FAQ database and post questions to our live help desk team. 
um, which can be accessed by visiting energystar.gov slash building pulp. Um, and then finally, if you're interested in learning about benchmarking or getting a refresher on multifamily housing properties, we invite you to register for our live session on October 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, you can also access all of our upcoming webinars and recordings of past webinars by accessing um, the links on this page as well. All right, so I think that covers all of our content for today. I want to thank every one of you for attending and um, responding to some of these interactive questions. Um, so we'll now open up the floor to our Q&A session and um, encourage anybody who has additional questions to submit those through 